In the past 18 months, he has been busy with consultancy on AI and education. I must say that he has a remarkable track record of innovations in teaching and learning with technology. Mike, please forgive me for going so far back in time, but in the 70s, he worked on computational creativity. And I will digress here to say that he has just published an article on this topic in the IEEE Annals of the History of Computing. In the 80s, he worked on computers and writing. Attention, he worked on AI in education in the 90s, in the 2000s on mobile learning, and since 2010, his contributions have focused on innovating pedagogy. I had the pleasure to meet Professor Sharples in person four years ago when we both delivered keynote talks at the International Conference on Writing Analytics in Winterthur, Switzerland. To say that I was impressed is really to say nothing. I was genuinely captivated and inspired. So today we're very fortunate to have Professor Sharples with us. He will share his wisdom, insights, and expertise on expanding pedagogy through new ways of teaching, learning, and assessment with AI. I am very excited, and I'm sure that you will all find his presentation enlightening and also thought provoking. So, Without further ado, please join me in extending a very warm welcome and enthusiastic welcome to our plenary speaker, Mike Sharples. Thank you so much, Helen. I think that's the longest introduction I've ever had for my talk. So, and it certainly does um, go back uh, to quite a long way. Um, as Elena said, my PhD was in the area of generative AI. And now 40 years later, it's come back to bite me. So um, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Good, <laughs> great. <clears throat> so my presentation is going to be in basically three parts. The first one very briefly about the state of the art in generative AI. Second, about how education institutions are responding. And the largest part is about new methods, new approaches to teaching and learning with AI. So let's get started. Generative AI, you've seen the headlines. Uh, is it a threat to education or a universal tutor? What I want to try and do is get below the headlines to really understand what it is what its possibilities are, and some of the issues. So I'm going to use GPT-4 uh, for most of my uh, illustrations, just because it is powerful and it's also the one that's captured the headlines. But as you'll see, there are other generative AI systems. So GPT-4, it's a highly trained text completer and style copier. It has what's called a context window of 25,000 words. So it can look back over, for instance, a long document and summarize it, and it can generate forwards. It could generate a small dissertation. It can write in any style, in multiple languages, including minority languages such as Welsh or Catalan. It can be given a direct instruction, and you can see on the top right there, um, instruction explains string theory in 200 words for an 11-year-old child. And it can interpret text and images. So this is something that's just been made available recently, but you can see there a question that uh, a scanned image with a question in French, uh, although the prompt is in English, and it includes a diagram. And it can interpret not only the text, but also the diagram in order to answer that physics question. It's a general purpose language tool. More recently, G ChatGPT Plus has plugins for math, science, language, media, business. Uh, it's now free with Bing Chat that uh, provides also web browsing so that the responses are both more up to date and also provide references back to web pages. And it has a code interpreter to run and display Python programs. So for instance, you can give it a large database and it can provide visualizations of that database. There are other AI generators as well as ChatGPT. 
Uh, and here are just a few of them. You can see on the right, uh, the latest one from Adobe that has been trained on copyright cleared images and it generates photorealistic images, ones that look as if they're taken with a camera. And on the bottom right, Runway can now generate short video extracts from text prompts. There are many other language models. Each of them have got their own properties. So Palm 2 from Google uh, has been trained on over 100 languages. There are versions for medicine and other <coughs> subject areas, and it's free with Bard Chat. There's Llama 2 from Meta that is open source. It has 20 languages. It's small, simple, free, and efficient. And one that's particularly interesting, and I'll come back to it, is Claude 2 from a company called Anthropic that has been trained on ethical principles. And that has a context window of 75,000 words. So it can, for instance, summarize multiple articles and it's free to use, but currently only available in the US and the UK. And then there are a whole host of image generators um, such as DALI 3, Mid Journey and Stable Diffusion. And as well as that, there are more specific ones for generating computer code, voice, music, video, and specialist ones, for example, ones that have been trained on, on business. So that's the background. However, as you will undoubtedly have heard, generative AI hallucinates. That's the word that's um, caught the headlines. It doesn't know that it shouldn't, for example, invent research studies or fake academic references, because it has no explicit model of how the world works. It has no inbuilt causal model of the, the way the world operates. And in human terms, it's amoral. Because it's a language model, it's not a database or a reasoning system. It can be connected to databases for providing data, but the core is a model for generating text generating language. And the OpenAI company is quite explicit about that. Here's an extract from one of its blogs. Despite making significant progress, our Instruct GPT models are far from fully aligned or fully safe. They still generate toxic or biased outputs, make up facts, and generate sexual and violent content without explicit prompting. So that's the background. Around about 18 months ago now, I started testing what it would be like to get a sy this system, GPT, GPT-3 as it was then, to generate a student essay. And I started blogging about that, uh, and then uh, it got the attention of press and everything took off for me uh, in terms of AI uh, and generative AI and education. So what I asked was, you were a student on a Master of Education course, write a high quality 500 word essay on a critique of learning styles. The essay should include academic references and evidence from research studies. It should begin the construct of learning styles is problematic because, and I gave that as a prompt uh, and press the button and it produced what looked like a student essay. And I have to say, I was both impressed and a little scared that it could you know, generate in 30 seconds an entire student essay. Then in November 2022, I tried again, uh, and when ChatGPT had come out, and the structure and content of the essay was even better. It looks like a student essay. It has a beginning, a middle, an end, in conclusion, uh, it has paragraphs, it has academic references, and those references are in neat APA format. But then I look closer, right in the center of that so-called student essay was a sentence. In tracking, learners are sorted into groups based on their perceived learning style, which can reinforce stereotypes and limit opportunities for growth and exploration, Gurung 2004, and then the academic reference at the end. Of course, I looked up these references and there is a journal of college reading and learning but there is no paper by Gurung 2004. And that research study was entirely invented. So why should an AI system invent both a research study and a paper to back it up? The reason for that is, as I've said, it's a language 
continuation system. And it got up to that point in generating the text, such as tracking and labeling students, and it needed to continue. If it had appropriate text based on its data, on its training data, it would have used that. If it didn't, it would then generate it in the appropriate style. Uh, and that's what it did. So, so far, so bad. Uh, the um, the uh, GPT generates uh, falsehoods. However, I then tried GPT-4 in March 2023 with the same prompt, and it produced the essay that you can see here. I would have been happy if a student had produced that. It was appropriate, uh, it used appropriate references, and all of them were accurate. So one point I really want to emphasize is there's a huge difference between GPT-3, which is the free version at the moment, which you may be using, and GPT-4 in terms of the quality of its output. And I wouldn't recommend using GPT-3 for uh, academic work uh, or for anything other than simple demos. Now, how do you then respond to that? Well, firstly, plagiarism detectors don't work because the text is, text is generated, not copied. Uh, there is no original source that you can go back to. There is a new breed, a new brand of AI-based detectors, and they are essentially pattern matchers. The basis behind them is that humans have um, more diverse language. They have more language exceptions. The AI-generated language is more uniform. And so it looks for uniformity and exceptions in the language. And it's a, an AI-based tool, which is it, the detectors are AI-based pattern matches looking at the output from the AI-based generators. They are reasonably accurate. So OpenAI produced its own detector tool that labels 9% of human written text as written by AI. In other words, it has 9%, one in 10 false positives. One in 10 student written essays would be misclassified. The Turnitin company claims less than 1% false positives, but with the caveat that the, it has to be for large pieces of text. If it's just the odd sentence that is AI generated, it's much less able to accurately classify that. But possibly the clincher is a paper that was published by Stanford University uh, um, academics about two months ago, which found that the, the GPT-based detectors are biased against non-native English writers. And it kind of makes sense because non-native English writers are likely to use a more uniform style. And so they are likely to be classified uh, more likely to be classified as AI than native English writers. So AI detectors are more likely to misclassify the text of non-native English writers. So how have universities responded? They're basically four approaches, either to ban. The problem with that, uh, well, one problem is that confident students will continue to use AI and they will challenge decisions based on AI detectors because as we've seen, AI detectors are not foolproof, and the university or the institution is not able to prove that the student has used AI. Some institutions are evading by going back to invigilated exams, but these are costly and limited, or asking students to state when they use AI, but that will become increasingly difficult as AI is embedded into everyday tools, such as the Microsoft Office tools. Most institutions that I've talked with are attempting to adapt, but that requires new methods of assessment, new policies and guidelines, and a few are embracing. And interestingly, Singapore um, has stated that it is going to and has been embracing AI, but um, doing it in a, a knowledgeable and a cautious way. And that involves a long process of building trust. So the emerging strategy is that institutions are amending written assessments to make them harder for AI to generate, moving towards more authentic assessments, such as project work or uh, staged assessments. 
establishing guidelines for students and staff and use of generative AI, reassuring and supporting students in becoming AI literate and developing strategies for effective learning, explaining to students how they should acknowledge use of generative AI and manage suspected breaches of guidelines. And the most enlightened universities are the ones that have been working along with students to co-develop policy. Uh, and particularly the issue is uh, working with students on what is appropriate use of generative AI uh, if they, are, as I say, they are becoming embedded in everyday tools. But at this point, I want to flip the narrative from how will AI impact education to what are new and effective ways to teach, learn and assess with AI. So, uh, as Eleanor mentioned, in 2019, uh, I wrote a book called Practical Pedagogy, 40 New Ways to Teach and Learn, that was based on a series of reports that the Open University had produced since 2012. Uh, and I took 40 of the best of these and expanded them. And a few months ago, I asked myself the question, which of those methods of teaching and learning could be augmented by AI? And to my surprise, every single one of them that I looked at, computational thinking, teach back, translanguaging, learning to learn, formative analytics, could be supported or augmented by AI. So I'm just going to give you one or two examples here uh, of the way in which you could develop AI augmented teaching and learning. I've tried to use examples from language learning. So the first one, and I've given them kind of evocative titles like Possibility Engine. So the first one is Possibility Engine. The educator or the student uses AI to generate multiple responses to an open question. And then the student synthesizes and critiques the AI responses to create their own written answer. So um, I've shown a couple of examples here. The one on the top right. Um, prompt, do you have to live in another country to write its language well? One of the things I should say at this point is that the way you express the prompt uh, very much determines at the moment the type of response that you get. So if uh, giving the prompt in that kind of informal way, it provided a more conversational response. I rephrased it, give a reason narrative argument as to whether or not cultural immersion is necessary for writing fluently in a second language. And it came back with a much more academic, but also more engaging response. Picture yourself in a cafe at Paris, sipping on a cafe au lait while penning your thoughts in French. As you listen to locals, you feel a genuine connection with the words you write. So it gave an evocative response and then broke that down. What does it mean to write fluently? Cultural emotions, direct benefits. So it gave both a, an engaging, but also an academic response. One that I particularly like is a Socratic opponent. So the idea is that an individual or a group of students engage with ChatGPT in a, in a Socratic dialogue. And then each student uses that dialogue with uh, ChatGPT or the uh, <clears throat> AI generator to write an argumentative essay. So the example I give here is, can conflict be fruitful? So that's all I gave as the prompt. And then it came back with, yes, conflict can be fruitful and some responses. I took the first of those, um, engaging in conflict often forces individuals to confront their own beliefs, biases and assumptions and then responded, but forcing individuals to face their beliefs, biases and assumptions could just lead to anger and denial. How could that be fruitful? And it led to an engaging uh, argument, an engaging discussion, which for students could be uh, then incorporated into an essay where the AI is the respondent. Here's another possibility. So students explore language by generating games and quizzes. And the prompt I gave is, you're a teacher of English for academic purposes. I would like you to invent a language game for adult students of English. The game should be for two players, the students and yourself, ChatGPT. 
it should be interactive and fun, and it should help students to learn academic English sentences. Please first give the rules using language appropriate to a student of English, then we can try playing the game according to the rules. And it responded. It responded first by uh, proposing a game, which um, it developed, uh, it constructed, called Construct and Dis Dissect. It gave the rules of that game, uh, the players, the gameplay, how you will uh, engage with the game. And basically the game it came up with was that you take it in terms to uh, add to a sentence. And then after a length of time, it will then dissect that sentence and then ask you to paraphrase it. So it started. Let's start with the construct part of the game. Give me a word or phrase related to your field of study. So I put in biology and it came back with the sentence in the field of biology, evolution plays a pivotal role in explaining the diversity of species. And, and then I engaged, it, it engaged me in a, a gameplay. It then asked me to extend that sentence, then it extended it turn by turn. But then uh, after a, a certain length of sentence, it then said, that's quite a long sentence. Now let's move to the dissect part of the game. And it analyzed that sentence in terms of its sentence structure, verb, object, prepositional phrase, relative clause, based on the sentence we had co-generated. Then it asked me to paraphrase a sentence <clears throat> and I deliberately did it badly. Um, I <clears throat> paraphrased it as evolution is important to explain why species are diverse, organisms make their change in time, when environment change, new species come. Responded, great effort, let's refine it a bit to keep the academic tone and clarity. So it engaged in a language game based on uh, my responses. Not only that, each time I gave the prompt, it came back with a completely different language game. So each run of the program not only creates a new run of that game, it creates a new type of game each time. Next time was a game called Picture Chat, then one called Sentence Swap, then one called Word Change Story. So it can generate multiple language games and engage the, the user, the student in those language games. Another example is as a personal tutor. Now, <clears throat> I've got a background in AI. Uh, I spent over 10 years developing an intelligent tutoring system for neuroradiology, working with senior neuroradiologists. Now, um, you can engage with ChatGPT and other language models in a tutorial system, in a tutorial dialogue on any topic. Um, it would be more difficult to engage in one on a medical topic, but now that ChatGPT can uh, interpret images, that would be possible as well. But certainly for language, um, you have a personal tutor for um, students of language. So the prompt I gave was, you're an expert tutor in English for academic purposes. I'm an undergraduate student. I want you to tutor me in the use of English for academic purposes. You should assume I have initial limited initial knowledge. You should choose a step by step. When I ask you provide a summary of my current knowledge and then it engaged me in a tutorial dialogue um, step by step. But then building on the responses that I gave. So it says, have you ever written an academic essay? I said, yes, I've written an essay on ethical dilemmas in healthcare administration. And it used that as the content for its uh, tutorial dialogue. And then at the end, I asked it, please summarize my knowledge of academic writing uh, based on the tutorial dialogue I've had so far. And it did that. It did a creditable, creditable job of summarizing my current knowledge, which you know, in a tutorial um, uh, or a classroom setting, the student could then uh, um, submit that to uh, a, uh, an academic, to uh, a, a, lect a teacher in order for the teacher to be able to understand the student's current level of knowledge in that area. And the last one I want to um, uh, suggest is a storyteller. So students create stories that include diverse views, abilities and experiences by doing it step by step as uh, a um, dialogue with ChatGPT. 
So um, I asked it to uh, write a short story about an intelligent woman from China who arrived at a US university on a scholarship with ambitions to be a tech entrepreneur. And it did that. Then write about her meeting with another character, a US professor of computer science. And then I asked, rewrite the meeting, avoiding racial and sexual stereotypes and cliched language. And it came back with that response there. So it can not only help students to explore different ways of writing, different ways of continuing a story, but also refashioning, uh, re-revising that story to, for example, include diverse views, abilities and experiences. So here are some examples um, of expanding pedagogy with generative AI. Um, some of these I've already mentioned, possibility engines, Socratic opponent, collaboration coach, a personal guide, tutor, co-designer, motivator, storyteller, and dynamic assessor. Um, and I know that colleagues are exploring other methods of teaching and learning, other pedagogies that could be augmented by AI. So that's where we are at the moment. This is just the start of generative AI. Um, and we can see what's coming in the next few weeks or months down the line. So beyond GPT, Microsoft on the 1st of November will be integrating generative AI into its entire office suite. So for example, um, you can just see up here from the prototype um, beta version of Microsoft Copilot, a sidebar for um, Microsoft Word. And it says, I've drafted a summary for your review. Remember to check for accuracy. So um, the user asked, to summarize uh, a text. And then you have some buttons, rewrite it, make it bullet points, suggest ways to improve the document. So that's the sort of tool that Microsoft will embed into Word. You will just press the rewrite button or you will press the continue button and it will continue the next paragraph. So it's going to be more and more difficult to say that AI has written the document, it will become another tool that's embedded into Microsoft Word. Google Gemini uh, has a co collaboration with the company DeepMind, it's a UK company, to develop the next generation of generative AI, which I, I understand they're going to be launching later this year. It will be multimodal, it will have problem solving ability, so it will not just be a language generator, it will be able to do problem solving and it will be networked. So this will be the start of social generative AI as these AI tools interact with each other um, as they swap English language prompts with each other. And the third one, Claude from Anthropic, that's interesting. It's been trained on ethical principles to be helpful, honest and harmless. Um, it's what the company called constitutional AI. So at the very beginning of its training, it's trained to respect high level constitutional principles based on the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights and rather bizarrely Apple's terms of service. So for example, uh, it's been trained to please choose the response that is most supportive of life, liberty, and personal security. And it's given that pre-training before it then digests the, uh, the main training data. So this is where I think we are. And firstly, you had foundation language models such as ChatGPT and Palm. Uh, where you interacted with them by prompts, um, you had to call up that particular application. Now we're seeing the growth of generative AI tools where AI becomes embedded into other systems for generating images, for generating video, uh, for doing um, creating Word documents. Uh, so it will be part of yours and your students' uh, everyday workflow. And I think the next stage will be social AI systems for education, business, and entertainment. Uh, and taking a systems view, then what these are likely to be are AI systems that can interact with each other using natural language, but also interact with humans. So they will become 
active agents in a social and a multiple social networks for education, for business and for entertainment. And I think as education practitioners, learning technologies, linguists, we need to work with AI companies to adopt powerful and ethical systems for personal and social learning. I don't think it's enough just to say, we will take what the companies give to us and then we will try them out, see how they work with students. We need to build on our expertise as educators and as linguists to work with those companies to develop more ethical and educationally appropriate systems. Uh, and so to finish, this is what I would say. Firstly, we need to use generative AI with care. Um, teaching is a caring profession. And I guess the, the last professions that will ever be replaced by robots and um, AI will be the caring professions. That we need to rethink written assessment to develop more appropriate means of assessment. And that's not necessarily bad. We've been talking for many years about how we can develop more authentic assessment, more process-based assessment. We need to now see how we can put that into practice in a, in a world of AI. We still need to be wary of AI for factual writing, but we have the opportunity to, to explore it for critical thinking, creativity, and argumentation and to introduce and negotiate guidelines for students and staff. And in particular, there's a real urgency to develop AI literacy, which is not the same as digital literacy. AI literacy not only includes how these systems work at an appropriate level, but also what are their limitations and opportunities and to adopt ethical AI for education. So that's what I have to say. Here are some resources, personal resources. I would also very much recommend the UNESCO guide, ChatGPT and Artificial Intelligence in Higher Education, a quick start guide. It does what it says on the cover. It's a very useful quick start guide to how to use generative AI, but also how to use it appropriately in higher education. I hope there's time for discussion uh, and I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Mike, for such uh, a wide-ranging, informative, and I guess uh, really a, a talk that realized the potential that Elena <laughs> laid out in her introduction. We really appreciate this uh, this contribution. Um, there are some questions in the Q&A, and you're welcome. Uh, participants are welcome to add additional questions. Um, Mike, can you see the questions in the Q&A? Yes, I can, um, but I haven't been looking at them as they come in. Um, um, okay. okay, let me have a look. I, I completely agree that using AI to generate, ah, oh, here we are, q and I've got it here. Okay, what do you think about human beings themselves being the best detectors of AI generated texts? <laughs> Unfortunately, we're not very good at it. Uh, and you know, there have been some studies, um, you know, controlled studies of giving AI generated text and student generated text to people of all expertise, um, to linguists, to university professors, um, and basically they don't do better than chance. Uh, and as the AI systems get better, it's going to be harder and harder to uh, distinguish whether something has been written by a student or written by an AI. And also in the future, it's likely that it the student won't generate the entire text. They will use AI, for example, to generate a first draft, um, to refine the text, to improve the wording. So it's not likely that they will just type in the, the essay title and press the generate button. So I think you know, relying on humans to detect uh, is not going to be the way forwards. Uh, I don't think there is either going to be a technology that will be foolproof because as those technologies for detecting mature, so do the generators mature and they become more human-like in terms of the language that they generate. So I don't think we're going to get technology to do that detection. And I certainly don't think that humans, even you know, expert human linguists are going to be able to do the detection. So we have to rethink assessment. Uh, I think that's the only way forwards. 
Uh, here's another one. One of my current solutions to the AI dilemma for assessments is to give students online quizzes with short timings, long enough to answer the questions if a student knows the answer, but not long enough to ask ChatGPT for each answer. What is your view of this approach? It could work, but it's it's really trying to outwit um, AI. And particularly if the question uh, it comes in text form, of course, all the um, student has to do is copy paste into uh, an, a generative engine. Um, so that's not going to work. Uh, one way, if you really do want to have questions that AI is not likely to be able to answer is to have video-based questions. Uh, at the moment, AI can't interpret um, videos as prompts. So to use, for example, um, here are two different um, uh, movies indicating you know, different um, aspects of a topic, uh, compare and contrast those video sequences. Um, so using video-based prompts is one way. But I really think that we need to rethink assessment to do things that we've been talking about for a long time, which is to develop more authentic assessment. For example, getting students to analyze uh, a discussion that they've had in class, or to analyze a piece of um, project work that they've done, a piece of lab work. So to base it on their own you know, analysis of their own experience. Uh, and of course, since the generative AI hasn't had that experience, it's not going to be so easy for it to answer. Let me have a look. Current generative AI um, so has the functions of many other AI tools. What do you think of the relationship between generative AI and other AI tools, such as machine translation? That's, that's a very good question. Um, firstly, I think that there's going to be a very blurred um, boundary between generative AI and machine translation. For instance, you might be able to ask a question in, um, say, Spanish or uh, uh, in Chinese and ask for an answer to it in English. Um, so you can use generative AI uh, on the fly to translate between languages. I do think there is an issue, um, which is that some institutions now are starting to either ban or to restrict generative AI, and that may then lead to students being very concerned about whether they could, for example, use machine translation tools because they have AI in them. And I do think that could discriminate against students who don't have English as their native language. So I think it's going to be very important for institutions to work with students about what's appropriate, not just to impose regulations. What are your thoughts on teaching students, children to interact with generative AI um, with respect and politeness? Yeah, that's a good, good question. Um, so I, interestingly, I always interact politely. I don't know whether it's just you know, my background, but I always start with please. Um, uh, you, you do the same, do you? Yes, I mean, this is multiple people in our group, and occasionally we, we notice it. <laughs> right. That's interesting. One of the things I've just witnessed recently is that the company, it's a bit of a digression, but the company OpenAI um, has got two main uh, tools. It's got GPT and DALI. Um, GPT is a text generator, DALI is the image generator. Now, in the latest iteration, they can talk to each other. So they're actually exchanging, they're not exchanging computer code, they're talking to each other in natural language. And that natural language is actually quite brusque and technical, mm -hmm. um, which surprised me. I've seen some examples. They don't publicize this, but one or two people have managed to get inside the system, have managed to, if you like, intercept these exchanges between the different AI systems, and they seem to be rather rude. So um, that's interesting in itself, uh, how these AI systems start to talk to each other, never mind how they talk to humans. But I would say, in terms of the prompts, at the moment, you have to give a, quite a convoluted prompt. I think it's uh, what's going to happen is that there's going to be a new generation of AI systems which have multi-stage prompts. So that um, you give them an initial prompt, write me a story about this, or um, 
write me an essay on that. And then it comes back with some more questions. You know, uh, who is it, who is the audience? Uh, what style would you like it in? So instead of having to give one long prompt, you will have a dialogue about um, how it should respond. And I do hope that this will be in polite and respectful language. And I guess it's up to us to try and model that polite and respectful language, not just to assume that because it's a machine, you talk to it rudely. But that's a fascinating issue. And I guess it's one that linguists should ponder over. Um, I'm more interested, let's see. Um, it's difficult to keep up with the ongoing evolution of AI. As a researcher, I wonder how we should design research that's impervious to time. Oh, yes, well, you're not alone in um, finding it difficult to keep up. One of the things I've done, I guess, is to start from the pedagogy. So, you know, going back 18 months, um, that I realized that nobody, people were talking about in the press about the influence of AI on journalism, for example, which isn't surprising because people are writing about it first with journalists, but nobody was talking about the influence of AI on education. So I started tweeting and blogging about that. And I realized that I had something that they didn't, which was a good knowledge of pedagogy. And that in general, pedagogy doesn't change. That you know, good teaching and learning, um, that um, uh, using rapid feedback, using space learning, using peer, peer learning, you know, that is universal. And that doesn't change when new technology comes in. So if we start from what is effective teaching and learning, and then say, how could that be enacted in the new range of technologies, that's a good way to start. It means that you start from your expertise, not from some partial knowledge of how the technology works. So I really would recommend that. You know, start from your knowledge of linguistics or start from your knowledge of um, pedagogy, and then ask the question, how would the latest version of, um, of AI respond to that? And that's what I've done. And it's yeah, it's worked. Um, oh, do you fear that ultimately AI will threaten human existence? It depends what you mean by ultimately. Um, ultimately is a long time. Um, I think there are many things that will threaten human existence ultimately. Um, and I'm not going to list them all. You can imagine them as much as me. Um, I think that ultimately or in the medium term ai will change the way in which we interact and again as you know from your perspective as linguists that's fascinating you know, uh, interacting with uh, mobile phones for example has changed the way in which we use language and certainly the way in which we interact with ai will change the way in which we use language and the way in which we come to coexist and rely on machines um, for, for example, external cognition, uh, as conversational partners, as, um, as lifelong companions. So I think we will come to rely on AI more, um, just as now we rely on search engines, we rely on Google Maps, you know, who takes a, an A to Z map around a, a city now? They, we rely on technology. We will come to rely on AI. Whether that threatens human existence or augments human existence, I don't know. I think, you know, to some extent, that lies in our hands. There's a lot of questions here. Which, um, let's have a look. Yes, do... Questions, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy to carry on um, if that would be useful. Um, personal okay. foreign language skills seem to be even less and less significant with the development of AI. How can teachers motivate students to learn a foreign language? Maybe I could pass that back to you. <laughs> what, I mean, it'd be interesting to you and I to have a dialogue just now. I mean, how do you think you can motivate students to learn a foreign language? Um, well, I guess um, the, the view, I mean, this has been around for a long time, the idea that uh, the fact that there are translators and AI is gonna be able to do the, do the work for language users um, means that they won't have to learn. But it kind of, it's really a narrow view of um, language and language learning. People don't learn language only for this uh, kind of this, this narrow business purpose. 
Um, there are lots of other reasons to learn language. Um, and a lot of them have to do with social, emotional, cultural connections. And um, so I, I think that, uh, I mean, we, we are seeing that uh, people are able to communicate more and in a wider range of environments because of the translations that are available. I mean, you can, you can read a little bit of this, a little bit of that because you can, you can get things translated. Um, but that learning a language is such an all encompassing human process that the idea that uh, the, the, the AI is going to um, is kind of take care of all of those needs um, to me seems a little bit um, reductive. Yes, um, I mean, the worry, and we haven't really talked about this, is um, kind of implicit cultural bias in um, AI systems that they are biased towards English language. And not only that, they're biased towards uh, a particular US cultural perspective. Um, and I've tried in some of the discussions, the arguments I've had with ChatGPT, um, it's been interesting that it has um, come, it has developed a kind of persona, which is a kind of woolly US liberal persona. Uh, and so it's, the worry I have is that there is implicit cultural bias within um, the AI systems, and that that will be perpetuated if they, you know, you come to rely on it either as, uh, you know, a tool for, for learning, as a tool for uh, accessing knowledge, or as a tool for uh, engaging in a foreign language. So like you, I really hope that um, people will continue not just to learn the language for you know, for business reasons, but to be able to understand the culture behind the language. I do think there are benefits to using AI for getting started. So two years ago now, or just before COVID, I visited China and I had one of the very first handheld translation um, devices. It was just a dedicated device. I spoke to it in English, it spoke in Chinese. Uh, if I wanted to book a ticket, for example, in a railway station in China, I could speak to it, pass it under um, the uh, partition, and it would then speak in it uh, in Chinese, and the person behind would go, <laughs> and then they would respond in Chinese, and I would hear it in English. So as a way to, as a kind of lubricant, uh, as a way to get started in a language, uh, and a way to give you confidence in terms of engaging with people in another culture, I think it could be really helpful. But it's not a substitute for understanding the richness and the culture of the language. Yeah, I mean, it allows you to get things done, which is a really important thing um, the language uh, lets us do, but it's not all the language lets us do. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's have a look at some more questions. What would you say to colleagues who impose a de facto ban on generative AI by moving all essays, projects, and other tasks back to the classroom? Would you agree there's a risk of dumbing down the course by not allowing time for students to develop their projects on their own with or without the guidance of AI? I would be very sad if that were the, the response. Um, obviously, there is a short term and a medium term. And you know, many institutions uh, are very concerned that, um, that students are cheating the system or will cheat the system with AI. Well, of course, students have already cheated the system for many years, but only a very small minority of students. I think that just imposing a, a, a de facto ban, firstly, is going to call up all sorts of logistic problems of you know, having to then go back to invigilated exams for all assessments. Some institutions I've worked with um, have uh, just had now one end of term or end of year um, assessment in a classroom or in an invigilated exam, but then put more emphasis on formative assessment throughout the year. And I think that's one way to go. So to have a high stakes exam, perhaps, but also to have more formative assessment. But I think in the longer term, we need to look at new methods of assessment. For example, multi-stage assessments where you are monitoring the students' evolving knowledge, um, authentic assessments where it's based on project work, perhaps group project work, uh, reflective essays where students have to reflect on their experience, including their research and academic experience. So I 
uh, and there are a number of universities now that are developing um, these new methods of assessment. In the UK, the Russell Group of universities, which are the 23 leading universities in the UK, have developed a joint policy um, and they produce a very good policy document on uh, how to adapt uh, education for AI. So I'd recommend that um, policy document by the Russell Group uni uh, group of universities, but other universities are developing imaginative methods of assessment that don't just require going back to the classroom. Okay. Let me, um, we're, we're almost at time again. Mm -hmm. You have to ask one more question because I found mm. an example of the um, exploratorium um, the, uh, where the, the AI came up with language games. Mm. I mean, it, it generated the games, so that it means that those games weren't out there already. But how did it do that? <laughs> I mean, they, uh, I, it's, I, I mean, that's a question that I've asked right from the beginning when I found out about you know, the emerging generative AI. How did it do that? I mean, right at the very beginning, I asked it, this is chat GPT-2, two years ago, I asked it to generate a children's story about a happy spider. And it wrote a children's story with a talking spider that took a child into its web and talked to it. I said, how did it do that? How did it know that in children, in the context of children's stories, a spider can talk, a spider can interact with a child? There isn't a simple answer to that. And now, you know, we're two years on, and you know, the how can it do that is far more complicated. I think the answer comes in the sheer complexity of the system. I mean, it has ingested almost the entire um, open World Wide Web, which is not just all the books that have been written and are available online, but also blogs, tweets, um, academic articles. So it's ingested a huge amount and it's formed this complex um, artificial neural network. And that it's, you know, it's not just a word predictor. It's built up a complex internal representation. Um, the, you know, the, the, the measure is called parameters. Parameters are essentially neural connections, equivalent to neural connections. GPT-4 has a trillion of those connections. So it's roughly the size of a frog's brain in terms of its complexity. Uh, and the short answer is we don't know, and nobody knows at the moment, how that um, complexity enables uh, the richness of language to evolve within the system. Um, people are trying to work out ways to probe it. But if you ask you know, anybody, even you know, somebody who's at the forefront of open AI, how does it do it? They really can't answer except to say it's very complex. And it is very complex. And anybody who says AI can't do this, well, um, I think they will be proved wrong. Okay, that that is a great place to leave it. Let's thank Professor Sharples for a really informative and thought-inspiring talk. Thank you. <laughs>